Life in the Spirit, in which we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit. I, I went to Fuller Theological Seminary, as many of you know, which is a mostly Presbyterian Reformed seminary, even though it's broadly Protestant evangelical. But before that, I went to a, a little more siloed of a school called Oral Roberts University. Now, when I began at Oral Roberts, when I first heard of it, I thought it was a dental school. Uh, <laughs> I actually had no idea who Oral Roberts was until I attended the university. And I chose Oral Roberts for one reason, uh, for worship and for the character of the students and the way in which those two things were married to each other. I knew that if I went to college, I was gonna become like the people that were in that college. What I found myself, as I was living in Oklahoma only for a couple years at the time, I started going with my sister to these worship services at Oral Roberts University. They were at seven o'clock at night and we would begin worship and, and we would go for four or five hours without stopping and we'd go till two in the morning and you would leave, and you can come and go as you wish, but you would leave feeling like it had been 10 minutes, completely refreshed, renewed, and restored. A place where I truly experienced just a, a, a real openness to the Holy Spirit, and I witnessed how that thirst and hunger for paraclete uh, made some of the most fruit-bearing Christians I'd ever seen. And realize that regardless of what kind of Christian you are, whether you're Catholic or Protestant, that you need, you, you need the Holy Spirit. You need the Holy Spirit. I long for the days in which a congregation could really pray for five hours and leave feeling like it was 10 minutes and not leave feeling like they just engaged in some type of asceticism, but really left feeling refreshed, renewed, and restored. I, I long for a spirit of revival. I, I long to come to a point as a church when we stop talking about all the great things God used to do, all these miracles we, we used to see, all these breakthroughs that we used to be a part of. I don't, I don't want any more used to's. And so we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit, okay? I promise I'm not going to have everybody speaking in tongues, but... <laughs> so just let the anxiety come down, all right? <laughs> um, okay, let's start with the ascension. If you have a Bible, you can follow along with me. Acts chapter 1, verse 1. You cannot understand the Holy Spirit until you understand the ascension. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit. Listen to how often the Holy Spirit, by the way, is mentioned in this passage. Through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the time or dates the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, while suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. It is one of those passages that's like 
you know, preacher gold mine. I mean, like, this is, there's just so much imagery in this. I say that all the time, I know, but this one is really good. There's this period between the resurrection and the ascension when Jesus gets weird. He, uh, he starts to do stuff that he didn't do before the resurrection. He starts to, to appear and disappear. He, he's veiled and then all of a sudden reveals that it's him. He, he will go through doors. He, he has this, this strange, angelic kind of thing going on where he seems to pass in between, as theologians we would say, the realm of heaven and the realm of this universe, just back and forth like, like it's no problem. And we have these stories in which Jesus keeps appearing and disappearing to the disciples, and this is really important. He continues to be with them, and they don't know it's him, and then he reveals that it's him, and then disappears. And what he's doing is revealing to them that they're going to be in a new posture and relationship with Jesus. Up to this point, Jesus has been like a rabbi, so they hang out together, they eat together, they go to the bathroom in the woods together, they sleep around the fire, they, you know, they joke. They, they've been hanging out for, for three years. Jesus is in his early 30s, and believe it or not, the 12 apostles were in their late teens. And so there's this group of young people that has been hanging out with this coach or mentor or rabbi, this person that they're looking up to for three years, and they hinge on his every word. Beyond those 12, there's a larger sort of group, sometimes called the 72, might even be bigger than that. So there's sort of this, this, this I, don't, I almost said posse, this, this group of people that's sort of always with Jesus wherever he goes. And that's gonna change. Jesus is gonna move from kind of constantly being with them to sort of, they never know if he's there or not. And there's lots and lots of these stories after the resurrection. One of the most famous is the road to Emmaus. Here's two guys, two of Jesus' disciples, and they're walking to Emmaus, and there's this fellow journeyer, and they don't know who he is. And the whole time, he's talking to them about the scripture and about Torah, and then they break bread, which is a symbol of Eucharist, and their eyes are open, and they realize that it's Jesus, and then he vanishes. And they say, we're not our hearts burning within us the whole time he spoke. How did we not recognize that was Jesus? It happens in the story of the nets going on the other side. You know, the, 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 the Jesus' disciples after the resurrection are trying to catch fish, and they can, and then there's this guy on the shore that's telling them to throw their nets to the other side. And they're like, well, yeah, come on. And this guy, no, throw your nets to the other side. I'm like, who's this dummy over here telling us to throw our nets to the other side? And they, so they finally do. They throw their nets over, and of course it comes up filled with fish, and then they realize, it's the Lord! Right? There's lots of these stories where Jesus is with people, but they don't recognize him. And what Jesus is doing is teaching them that he's going to be present with them in a different way. He's not gonna be present with them as a guy, you know, with a staff and his robe, walking alongside them in the way that they're used to. There's gonna be a new, actually more powerful way in which Jesus is going to live with them and be alongside them and comfort them and teach them. Uh, and, and Jesus is going to become omnipresent by becoming the church. And so Jesus is sort of preparing them. And in this 40 days when he's sort of appearing and vanishing, appearing and vanishing, Acts verse, the passage we just read in verse 3 says, and while he was doing it, he was always teaching them about the kingdom of God. So it's like every time he appears, he's talking about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God, over and over, over and over. And, and so right before he ascends into heaven, what is the question they ask him? Jesus, are you now going to restore your throne to Israel? Are you going to restore the kingdom of God to Israel? When Jesus, the Jews love numbers. They love them. And so when a number is mentioned in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, it's a really big deal. It is a big deal that Jesus chose 12 apostles. Do you know why? Because the number 12 for a Jewish man or woman is always, always associated with the 12 tribes of Israel. With all of Israel. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob has 12 sons and those 12 sons become the 12 tribes of Israel that make up this nation and body of people. Jesus specifically picks 12 apostles in order to 
project the very clear message that he is going to restore Israel and that he is the prophesied Messiah. And so this is on everybody's mind as they're following him because the kingdom of God uh, phrase is not something Jesus mentioned. This is all invented, rather. It's all through the scripture. And the way in which Jesus' contemporaries view the kingdom of God is that God's going to come back. He's going to make Israel kind of like Rome where Israel, through military power, will become the sort of global dominant government. And from that throne, goodness and righteousness and justice will flow, unlike the bad governments like Rome that have idolatry and that are unjust and that are pagan. God will use the small nation of Israel to, to, and Jerusalem will be its capital and the whole world will be ruled by the kingdom of God, which will be a literal government They think Jesus will be the king of an actual literal kingdom that's an actual government that has a military and has its own roads and its own postal service (laughs) and that that will become the kingdom of God. And then so you've got these young men in their early 20s and late teens following Jesus and they're stoked because they're going to get the top jobs in this government. They're going to be generals and they're going to be bureaucrats and they're going to be governors and they're going to have land and property and they're going to sort of rule justly. They're going to be like the Knights of the Table Round with King Arthur, you know. They, they look forward to being on the inner circle of the king's court. And so when Jesus dies on the cross, when he's crucified, this, this what they think is a fantasy, sort of vanishes and they go, okay, this isn't going to happen. There isn't going to be this new government. And so when Jesus is raised from the dead and he's talking about the kingdom of God, they're kind of like, oh, well, maybe this is actually going to happen now. Maybe, maybe there is going to be this government. And so, so Jesus uh, says to them, uh, no, no, uh, that's not what I'm talking about. But yes, I am going to be king of this kingdom. And yes, it is going to rule the whole world. And no, it's not going to be like Rome. And no, it's not going to have its own military. It's going to be something much bigger and better than that. You know, When Jesus ascends into heaven, what does he ascend to? Do we know? He he ascends to his throne. And so although Jesus is not becoming the king of like a government, Jesus is becoming the new king of the universe. And that through him all nations and all kingdoms will be healed. That true justice will come. Not through government, but through the hearts of men and women. And that by being the king of their hearts, he will transform the whole universe and reconcile it to his father. Isn't that good news? Isn't that good news? And so Jesus says, uh, essentially tells them that he's going to sit on this throne. And the word that we often use is this word gospel. Uh, Gospel is an old English word that used to mean God spell, meaning God's, God's spell or God's message. And it comes from euangelion, you and Galeon, you see that first one, you, is, it means good. And Galeon means message. You'll notice that it's the same word as angel, because an angel is a messenger. And this is the word where we get evangelism from. You and Galeon is the gospel. And this gospel is a contemporary word not invented by Christians. When a great battle was won, or when a king ascended to a throne in the midst of anarchy, Um, heralds would go out into all the land and proclaim the euangelion. They would herald the good news that a new king has ascended to the throne and that his reign is coming and that you better get your stuff together and you better get things right because the reign of the king is coming and you better get on board with it. It's good news. It's good news that anarchy is over and that there will be law and there will be justice and there will be goodness and rightness and things, things will be set right by this, this king. And so the good news, the evangelism, if you hear anything I say, evangelism is going into all the world, all the darkest, worst, heinous places of the world, and saying Jesus is king of this. Preaching the gospel 
is going into Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth where there's the worst injustice, where there's the greatest pain, and saying, Jesus is the king of this. This will be set right. Proclamation, a heralding of the gospel is to say, Jesus is king. Jesus is king of my marriage. Jesus is king of my church. Jesus is king of my country. Jesus is king of sex trafficking. That will come to an end. Jesus is king of dirty water in Africa. That is, that is not the king's way. That will come to an end. I proclaim that's the gospel. People are separated from God, living in quiet desperation, lonely, broken. No, Jesus is the king of this life, and, and he will redeem it and rescue it. And so evangelism in the gospel is proclaiming that the ascension happened that Jesus sits on the throne of the universe. And that's very, very good news, isn't it? That's very good news. And so Jesus says, you know, before you go and before you proclaim this, you need to wait. Don't go yet. You need to wait for the big guns. That's what I call them. Big guns. You need to wait for the big guns. You need to wait for the Holy Spirit which will give you dynamis or dunamis. Dunamis is power. It is the word that we get dynamite from. It is literally explosive power to do my work, to actually enact my rightness, to actually believe thy kingdom come, thy will be done in Orange County as it is in heaven. Amen? That there is there is in this power the ability to speak uh, not as a pretender but as a, a true proclaimer and herald of the king that this will be undone and I'm gonna do it because I've been given the big guns I've been given the dynamis I've been given the power I've been given paraclete this word dynamis literally means from Strong's inherent power, the power to do miracles, and the power to be a moral person and to do what is right in the face of great evil. Power. Jesus gives a name to the Holy Spirit. He calls him paraclete. This is a word we often use, paraclete, as, as like a, a noun to describe the Holy Spirit. We often think Holy Spirit is his name. But a lot of scholars really think that when Jesus refers to this comforter, this advocate, this helper, this comforter, this word paraclete, that maybe Jesus is actually calling him by name. The third person of the Trinity, paraclete, he's a person. Some of you say, well, isn't it she? It's just don't give it a gender, all right? We're just gender neutral here, all right? Paraclete. Is, comes alongside. That's literally what it means. Paraclete means called to one side to be a friend, to be a helper, to be uh, the power. And that is what the Holy Spirit does. It empowers the heralds of the kingdom of God, those who are going to dark places proclaiming that Jesus is king. It's the power to undo that darkness. It's the dynamite. The good dynamite. The first time I saw the Holy Spirit moving was on a missionary trip to Thailand with some of the darkest, most horrible spiritual bondage. We couldn't pretend to be Christian there. We had to have the paraclete. We had to have paraclete doing our work for us, doing miracles, breaking chains. That's a place where kids were sold into sex slavery and where real demonic worship was happening. We couldn't pretend to be Christian there. We had to actually have dunamis there. I'm really concerned for the church in America, guys. I'm really, really concerned. It's too easy to be Christian here, to pretend. It's too easy to inoculate ourselves from the Holy Spirit. And I don't know what it means to blaspheme the Holy Spirit, but I've often wondered if that's just it. You know, I'm sorry to keep to stay on this. Did you know you can't like Jesus? And Jesus, everywhere he went, was the most polarizing figure. People either said, we worship you, or they said, crucify him. Everywhere Jesus went, he polarized people. They, they picked a side, and he didn't necessarily force them to. There was just something about the power 
of, of the spirit within him that people said, I, I must bow down before him and worship him or I must kill this man. You, you cannot like Jesus. You cannot be kind to Christian. We must have the Holy Spirit and we must have its, its power. And the Holy Spirit continues to do great things in the world today. He does miracles. The Holy Spirit still heals people from sickness. The Holy Spirit still prophesies. The Holy Spirit still gives words of knowledge. The Holy Spirit still teaches and gives direction. The Holy Spirit still speaks to the church. You know, I was in, I was in line for tacos yesterday. <laughs> Talking to a guy uh, about church and he sort of got quiet for a second and crossed his arms, a young guy, probably 21, 22, and told, turned to me and said, you know what, I, I, God just wants me to tell you that whatever it is that's going on in your family, he's gonna sort it out and everything's gonna be okay. And he looked like as he was saying it, he was like really nervous. Like he, God put this thing on his heart and he was like really wrestling with the Lord on whether or not he should say this. And I said, oh, uh, do you know, did somebody tell you, do you know? I don't, I, he's like, no, I don't, I don't know, I don't know what this is about, it just the Lord told me to tell you this. Come to find out that this, this guy, for those of you who don't know, my son has epilepsy and this is something we've been dealing with. And uh, this guy uh, w- was epileptic, he was an ep- epileptic child. And so every day of his life, he would have one seizure, every day, grand mal seizure, until he was 12. And then at the age of 12, It stopped. And he said, I'm a testimony. Everything's gonna be okay. So God used a a a rescued epileptic child that's now a successful young man, and he was obedient to the voice of the Holy Spirit to speak into my life. The Holy Spirit is alive. The Paraclete is at work. Are we immunized? Are our hearts too cold? Are we going to say, I don't need that, I have my Bible? Are we gonna say, I don't need that, I have our hymns and our spiritual songs, and we have our Sunday morning worship, and I don't need the Holy Spirit because everything's fine? Or are we gonna say, there are dark places, evil places, And we will go in and herald that Jesus is king of this. And not just pretend, but have real power to do what God wants us to do. Real power to speak into people's lives. Real power to teach with authority. Real power to have spiritual knowledge. Real power to pray and undo spiritual chains. Uh, The answer is yes. Amen? Amen. We're gonna know Pericles. Okay. And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.